what dietary strategies do you think are best for mitochondrial health? Because I, I do want to really drill down into mitochondria. Some things that obviously may come to mind for people is keto, fasting, blood sugar. There's also maybe some nuance here where too much fasting, too low carb may not be optimal, especially too low protein if we're talking about fasting and caloric consumption. Yeah. So what I appreciate about your perspective is you're not just talking about this, you're consulting with people one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you really get a chance to see where there's weak points in the arguments or compliance might be really low or whatever looked right. good as a theory may not map onto clinical application very well. Uh, so how do you think about diet? That's a very broad question, but. Yeah, I, th I think about the, we think about the mitochondria a lot. And there are some things that you do specifically for the mitochondria, right? Like, um, like an ozone sauna or something that boosts NAD levels or, you know, red light therapy or things like that. Those are kind of directed right at the mitochondria, right? In terms of improving ATP production. Um, and we love all that. The other thing that really focuses on mitochondrial health is molecular hydrogen, right? It really helps you manage the oxidative stress. It upregulates the three uh, sort of... Mm, Wait, I'm sorry. Let's, let's define that for people if they have... I think many people probably have heard of it, but can you give yeah. people you know, what that is, how they use it? And then, yeah, let's talk more about that. Yeah, molecular hydrogen. So it's H2 um, and, you know, it's the most abundant atom in the universe. Um, it turns out that molecular hydrogen has some really incredible health benefits, and you can you can drink it, you can take a bath in it, you can get it in an IV, uh, and you can basically inhale it. So the easiest way to get it is to put some tablets in some water and let it dissolve. It's usually uh, the tablets are comprised of magnesium and some other elements. And Which I did this morning, by the way. Okay, <laughs> I, I good for you. I do morning yeah. and pre-workout. Nice, nice. Yeah, we love it. So anyway, it, it basically generates hydrogen gas in the water. There's a chemical reaction between the magnesium and the H2O that liberates the H2. So it looks kind of like if you drop a fizzy in the bottom of a glass of water, it sort of fizzes and you get bubbles and you get this magnesium film that's left. Um, it doesn't taste bad. It's, I don't know, to me, it's a little citrusy. Um, and you drink it down fairly quickly uh, because the hydrogen will, of course, dissipate into the air and you use it out of a glass or a metal cup um, so that it doesn't bleed through the sidewalls of the plastic if you're using something like that. So that being said, once it gets into your system, it's pretty magical. It has the ability to upregulate uh, superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, catalase. So the three enzymes that basically, in kind of an assembly line fashion, will take a free radical that's generated from the mitochondria when it's burning oxygen and burning fuel uh, think of your mitochondria like an engine, right? It's it's burning oxygen, it's burning fuel, it has exhaust. The exhaust are the, uh, the, the free radicals. And the hydrogen potentiates the ability of the catalytic converter to handle those toxic particles. That's pretty much what's going on. And so, you know, as things wear down and mitochondria get weaker and cell membranes get weaker and things like that, uh, there's more oxidative stress and then the mitochondrial DNA gets damaged and then the electron transport chain gets compromised because the membranes get compromised by the oxygen free radicals. So in the aging process, it's very important to continue to upregulate that. And genetically, some people are more gifted than others in their genetic expression of those three enzymes. So if you know your genetics and you know that, hey, I don't make superoxide dismutase very well, or whatever, then there are things you can do to upregulate that. Uh, like either you can give um, glycodin, which will upregulate it, or you can take molecular hydrogen, which will upregulate it. Um, and if you're low on glutathione peroxidase or your glutathione levels are low, rather than taking glutathione, we're big fans of Glynac. So you can basically build glutathione that way. But the point is, <clears throat> those are things, excuse me, those are things you do directly for the mitochondria but really, mitochondrial health uh, depends a lot on the quality of everything else, right? Like the fatty acids that you're getting in, right? Can you maintain the membranes? And, and by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. I really do appreciate hearing what people think. So I'll look forward to reviewing your comments. There's a, a membrane out there, <clears throat> membrane fatty acid called C15 that you probably have heard about. Um, it basically is a pentadecanoic acid that um, now is being 
shown to maybe be more powerful than rapamycin in terms of the longevity benefits, right? It, it upregulates many, many things, but it's also associated with membrane integrity. And so you can look at this membrane is that, integrity. Sorry, this is, a, this is that new fatty acid. It, I think it's in a white bottle. I think I saw it come right. through. Oh, fatty 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I never had a chance to research that. So you're a fan of it, I take, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's really quite, <clears throat> quite interesting. Um, yeah, we become fans of it. It turns out that in blue zones, people have higher levels of, of C15. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a trace fat, like it's not a high percentage of the fat in your cell membrane, but for them, it might be like 0.4 to 0.6% of the uh, cell membrane fats. When we measure people, most of the people we measure are like 0.1 or 0.09 or 0.08 or 1.1 or somewhere in there. And these are people I'm assuming are already on a pretty decent diet. You're not seeing yep. like a standard American population. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. No, these are people that are clients that are, you know, their diet's dialed in, they're doing stuff, and that's where they're coming out. Mm, and it, it turns out that the reason that it's high in the in the blue zones, some of them at least, um, they're eating cheeses. It comes from dairy. They're eating cheeses that are rich mm -hmm. in dietary uh, dairy fat, um, and they're eating aged cheeses, which are concentrating – the C15. And so some of these healthy cheeses are boosting their C15 levels, which is pretty interesting. interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. It's one of the things that gives me pause about <clears throat> people being on overly restrictive diets. And, and I get it. You need those tools sometimes That's right. to heal as sort of a rehab plan. That's but right. uh, just one more reminder for our audience, as we heal one's gut amongst other things and food tolerance increases, really try to expand and that's right. be careful about what you've been told, right? Because if you, you can find some guru that vilifies literally every, I mean, Everything. it's getting to the point now where Everything. broccoli now, some people that's are right. criticizing. Um, that's right. And then coming back to molecular hydrogen, yep. what really caught my attention was a meta-analysis that was published, I think just this year. So a meta-analysis for our audience, just a quick reminder, is going to summarize multiple clinical trials, give you an aggregation of what the research is showing demonstrating improvements over placebo when administered to people with chronic fatigue for their energy yeah. levels. Yeah. So it's not just theoretical. There's some decent science uh, yep. that's published. On, and for something that costs, I don't know, what is it, Jeff, $30, $40, maybe $50 yeah. for a bottle. It's that's not right. expensive. Very no, easy to not, do. That's right. It's very doable. Yeah. And and I'll, I'll just say this. We've actually imprinted our hydrogen with um, with information using an infoceutical um, from NES. So we have hydrogen that contains energy. We have hydrogen that contains chill. And we did uh, not published trials, but little trials with this. And it's it's remarkable. Like if you take this at two in the afternoon when you're feeling tired, you know, you perk right back up 10, 15 minutes later. It's like, oh, wow, just woke up. It's really remarkable. Hydrogen in and of itself is great. They did a head-to-head -head trial of hydrogen and caffeine in college students that were sleep deprived. And they find that hydrogen did as well as caffeine in terms of rebooting their brains. It just did it by a different mechanism. Yeah. So hydrogen is for real. I mean, it's it's really, uh, it's the real deal. That's uh, So anyway, but yeah, I think back to the mitochondria, I think all those things can be helpful, but you do want to have this good diet. You do want to rest. You do want to sleep. And, you know, all the basics, of course, um, inflammation in general, will, which is obviously related to the gut. So taking care of all the baseline things goes a long ways towards helping your mitochondria work properly. And then mitochondria love to be exercised, right? Those engines love to be revved, right? If you've got a, got a Ferrari, you want to rev it to 9,000 RPMs. Your mitochondria <laughs> want to be... Yeah. Yeah, they want to be worked, right? They do. And so if you're not doing the aerobic exercise to really rev those mitochondria, then you're, you're missing an opportunity for health. 